to be back in Tassie, as you've probably seen, Damon and myself have uh, managed to do a couple of videos since I've been back, supposedly on holiday. Um, but the holiday never ends when you have a Land Rover, as we know. But the great thing is, uh, coming up in April, it actually marks, what, six? Six mm. years. Six years, yeah. Of, of Seriously Series. Uh, we missed the fifth anniversary, so we thought we'd make up with it for six. Um, and we've never done anything the usual way before, so yeah. why not make it our own, hey? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it's great to have Damon here and what we're going to do a bit of a special video for them, aren't we? Yep, just for the landy lovers. We've gone through all our adventures over the last six years and Damon and myself have sat down and discussed which bits we're going to pick out. Uh, we've obviously made it heavily biased towards the Landy fanboys uh, and obviously kept much of the nattering on out of it as much as possible. But we've tried to keep it in there too, just to get the storyline to flow a little bit for you. And obviously uh, along the way we'll have links popping up so you can actually view those episodes and series along the way if you've missed out on them over the years. So I think that's all I have to say, Damon. Yeah, anything else? Just prepare yourself for owning Land Rovers. That's it. So get a brew or something slightly stronger and sit back and relax. It was founded in a very different world, at a very different time. Fidel Castro had led the communist revolution in Cuba. Yuri Gagarin became the first man to journey into outer space. The Berlin Wall had just been erected, and Sierra Leone had gained independence from the United Kingdom. Though while these global events unfolded, there was something moving behind the scenes, which was playing its own part overseas and abroad, preserving and defending life, just as it always has. Times may have changed, though the need for a helping hand has not. And since 1961, it has done just that. It's not a defender. Nor is it a discovery. It is something far simpler, and therefore much greater. It is part of a series, a number of steps in evolution. It is a Land Rover Series 2. Its home is on a rugged, windswept island called Tasmania. Here, its impact has been felt, as it has helped to construct vast hydroelectric schemes, brought the agricultural industry into the 20th century, and is still the longest serving vehicle to have served in the Australian Army. Though the question beckons, some 53 years on, do these trusty vehicles still have what it takes.
G'day, my name's Jeff Lewis, and over the next few episodes, we're going to be taking this 1961 Land Rover on a 3,000 mile or 4,500 kilometre journey from here in the lovely mountainous regions of Tasmania all the way across to Perth, Western Australia, taking it across one of the harshest continents on this planet. But it's not for just any vehicle, and this isn't any vehicle, this is a medium. of Wilmington and in Wilmington there was a small little museum the Wilmington Toy Museum and Land Rovers and Jeeps too. Admiring the Land Rovers and the old Willys Jeep out the front we made our way into the museum and wow it doesn't matter how old you are there is definitely at least one or more toys that will bring back a few memories of your childhood. The museum started by David Christie's. The obsession had been a lifelong pursuit and many of the toys date back from the interim war period right up to the present. Though having been offered by many collectors to buy the collection, David has turned them down. His answer was simple, it is my collection and there are some things more important to life than money. The museum is claimed to have the largest toy collection of Land Rovers. But I wonder if they've got a few life-size ones. We might be able to have a chat and try our luck with finding a few spare parts. So how many do you have? I asked. Oh, just 60 Land Rovers plus parts. Oh, and don't forget the Jeeps. <laughs> Within their collection, there are some very nice examples. It really encapsulates the influence that the Land Rover had and has had on Australia. David and Adrian were great. They helped us out with our spares that were much needed and definitely created one of the great highlights of the trip so far. As I awoke from my swag to the stunning scenery on the Australian Bight, I looked at the Land Rover and I couldn't believe it. I'd paid some $400 for the Land Rover eight years ago. And it had made it. It had made it all this way. Truly inspiring. Right, so we're 25 kilometres this way in South Australia from the Western Australian border. Um, we got to this lovely little campsite here last night. Um, as you can see, absolutely stunning views. and. A little bit desolate out here, but the weather's pretty good for today. We had a few issues along the way though. Um, the Speedo decided to uh, give up the ghost and uh, we had to stop and disconnect the Speedo and make up a little temporary arrangement in the engine bay. So the Speedo cable's just sitting there spinning doing its own thing. So we'll be heading to Cocklebitty and we'll be heading down to Twilight Cove and doing a little bit of beach driving along the way. 
Anyway, we'll catch you there. Right from the trip, it was known as the biggest barrier. This would be the Nullarbor Plain, which is some 77,000 square miles. It is the largest exposed limestone bedrock in the world. It is hard to believe that this dry, hostile place was once a shallow seabed. Small organisms over tens of millions of years form the calcium much needed to help build the limestone we see today. Though very dry, the Nullarbor hosts some of the most extensive cave systems in Australia, which formed during the Miocene some 20 million years ago. This has acted as a time capsule and has preserved many artefacts and animal remains. Temperatures today have rose up to 40 degrees centigrade and we hadn't seen any civilization except for a service station which was some 300 kilometers back down the road. There was no one, just us and the road. When I bought the Land Rover, it was rather tired. It had spent the last 15 years on a rural property. Mechanically, it wasn't too bad, though the body was rather tired. The chassis needed some work and the wiring was in a bad way and it shorted out and caught on fire on the first trip I took it on. Though it took four years before the trusty vehicle was ready to be registered. Many issues were overcome along the way. Replacing the rear cross member, learning how to spray paint a car, rebuilding the transfer case, and much, much more. Though having learnt these vital skills, it has helped to develop a greater peace of mind for myself. As I now know, if something does go wrong, I would have a fair chance of getting myself out of trouble. So we've passed over some pretty rough terrain the past couple of days and we were just doing a little pre-systems check this morning and I noticed that we were missing um, a couple park lights. Luckily we pulled up camp here today though and we should be able to get a few spare globes out of these ones. So we'll take them off and have a look. Ah. A little bit dirty around it, but put in a bit of Coca-Cola, a little bit of emery cloth, and she'll get us to Perth at least. Yeah, so we've come across a few wrecks here, and this is uh, an old Suzuki, or known as a Suzuki Mighty Boy. And it's quite a shame, because um, if you look under the bonnet, it's actually all pretty complete, considering its age. These actually weren't a bad vehicle in their day. Um, I believe they came out with a little two-stroke engine. They were a little bit underpowered, but you could easily get a conversion kit to put a four-cylinder uh, Toyota Corolla engine in them. So to see it in this state, it's a real shame. And particularly these older four-wheel drives, just like the Land Rover, they've got a heck of a lot to offer. Um, they're a lot lighter, heck of a lot simpler, and you don't have these funny Fandango things called computers in them. We had had two weeks of rain, 
making the Holland track impassable. Though a track following adjacent to it, the Victorian Rock Road, named after Queen Victoria, was still passable. As we headed south from Coolgardie, the light corrugations littered the road, and the sides were lined with light woodland. Though the woodland faded into the vast open spinifex plains, and oh, deep severe corrugations, it was a real worry that the spring shackle bolts may fail. What was meant to be a road all but faded from our minds as we were faced with deep bogs and mud that lay ahead. It caught us out once or twice and brought the Land Rover close to rolling over. It was a relief to reach the tarmac minus a few nuts and bolts. And by sunset of that day, we had emptied our last jerry can into the Land Rover with 50 kilometres to go. There was no chance. No chance of getting any more fuel. We had both run completely and utterly out of money. We were broke. Though with luck we made it. We made it from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Indian Ocean in a Land Rover Series 2. Since I spoke to you last on the straight, we've covered a fair bit of ground. We've pushed up into the desert country of Kalgoorlie and then we took an alternative route down the Hydman Norseman Road. This was a pretty interesting road at times. Um, we have had actually quite a bit of rain over the past couple of days. So in places there was a fair bit of mud and there was a heck of a lot of corrugations. Not to mention some pretty deep ruts too. So it made driving pretty interesting, but it was definitely worthwhile. The landscape's changed, the topography's changed, and so has the vegetation too. And we've made our way finally all the way from the Tasman Ocean over to here, the Indian Ocean, and now we're down here on the beautiful coastline just south of Bunbury. So the whole trip goes to prove that you don't need the newest and greatest vehicle to, in order to see the wonderful world we live in, and certainly not to see Australia. So, as long as you maintain it, set yourself reasonable miles each day, anything's possible.
From Queenstown, we headed south, over a mountain range and along a lost road. This road slowly petered into a track and became enclosed in dense undergrowth. With high rainfall and torrents of water having rolled down off the sides of the peaks, it had washed much of the quartzite gravel off the track. Though through the haze of the afternoon twilight we ascended, and the dense undergrowth slowly faded away as we increased in altitude and winded our way round the pearly white peaks. This track was last used to gain access to the potential site of the Franklin Dam. For over the last 30 years it's been left dormant, only to be enjoyed by a few intrepid travellers. This is a very special track in the fact that it gives access to one of the most enclosed and one of the most locked away parts of this world, the Southwest.